Okay, in this video, we're going to take a look at some specific facets of evolution, starting with the difference between convergent and divergent evolution. You should have learned about natural selection already and the idea that evolution can be brought about in different ways, including changes in allele frequencies. And then now we're looking at some of the details of evolution. So if you look at these two examples, uh, actually in this unit, there's a lot of this versus that comparisons, allopatric versus sympatric speciation, convergent versus divergent evolution. So here, let's make sure we understand the difference between these two terms here. Convergent means coming together, right? So from two distant points, we're reaching a very similar point. So the idea here is that you get something called analogous structures. That is things that have a very different evolutionary origin, but end up with very similar traits because of environmental pressures or similar environmental pressures. And we call those traits uh, analogous. They're analogous as opposed to homologous or meaning same or originating from the same. So these four animals here, the anteater, African aardvark, echidna, and Australian numbat all have similar long, long shaped snouts for acquiring food due to the similar environments they're in. But if you actually look at the evidence and look at some of their evolutionary origins, you'll find that they are very, very different. Another example is echolocation, which is a trait that I wish I had. Bats, Tooth whales and shrews use this to capture their prey uh, by sending out sound and detecting how long it takes to get back. And by that, they get a kind of, a, it's not a visual map, but for us to kind of perceive it, it seems like a visual map. It's, it's sonar. So they're sending out uh, sound waves and detecting at which at different weight rates that they actually come back, these waves. And then so they actually do that. So that's an example. So whales and bats, shrews, uh, very different evolutionary origins, but they all have evolved echolocation. So that's an analogous behavior. Divergent, on the other hand, is where two or more adaptations have a common evolutionary origin. So they're separating out, but they still retain some of these structures that are very similar. Uh, another word for this is adaptive radiation, and they give rise to homologous structures, the most famous of which is the pentadactyl limb. So if you look at our five fingered limb of all of these different animals here, the human, cow, whale, bat, even a, a whale with its big old flipper, you take off that glove of the flipper and you can take a look at the bones inside. And there are definitely similarities that point to a similar evolutionary origin. So in that case, we call it a homologous structure. Darwin's finches, the different sizes of the beaks adapted for different types of food sources as the environment changed is another example of that. So that's convergent versus divergent evolution. Here's a larger diagram showing you the idea of divergent evolution and homologous structures using the example of the pentadactyl limb. You can study in more detail here, but it's really amazing to see that all these animals have a very similar pentadactyl limb. Check that out. Even the bat up here. Look at that. Looks like five long scary fingers. They're all just different adaptations of the same basic design which shows our evolutionary uh, ancestry. Very, very interesting. Another way to look at evolution is to consider the difference between something called gradualism and the punctuated equilibrium theory. So as in previous examples, there's a lot of different this or that situations, sympatric versus allopatric speciation, conversion versus divergent evolution. And now we have uh, two different ideas, gradualism versus punctuated equilibrium. If you look at the diagram here, gradualism is the idea that species changing over time happens very gradually and slowly. And so as a result of that, we should expect that we see many, many different intermediate forms. And the evidence for this uh, varies depending on the type of living thing that we're looking at. But there have been a lot of missing pieces. So we should be seeing lots of transitional pieces, but the fossil record is not very good at actually recording all of that for us, or we haven't found enough of it. And so another idea came along, and the, this idea was maybe evolution doesn't really happen like that in a gradual way with mutations and alleles changing. Maybe it only happens very quickly in very short bursts following things like major catastrophes or major events, volcanoes, meteors, could lead to rapid speciation. So this idea was kind of developed as a result of 
the lack of evidence in transitional models, transi transitional organisms that we might expect to find. So this is an idea here. The gradualistic model shows slow change uh, over time, gradually very smooth. A more punctuated model shows that new species arise very rapidly. So there's two different ways and there's evidence supporting both and we're finding out more and more stuff. The key thing here is that scientists are not arguing about whether or not evolution happened. If you study biology and you know you look at DNA or any genetics, any of this is all based on our evolutionary past. So the only arguments that are happening right now are the details about how it may have happened. Okay, using the best evidence. So that's one additional thing, the pace of evolution. When discussing evolution, we talked about one of the ways of that happening is by changing allele frequencies. Remember that alleles are different forms of a gene and they're different by maybe a few bases. Remember a gene is just a strand of DNA that's coding for a specific protein when transcribed and translated. Many genes have more than one form, like a dominant and recessive form, or like blood types, there's three different forms. So if a gene exists in more than one form, it is said to have multiple forms. In other words, polymorphic. It is said to be polymorphic. If for a gene with two alleles, if both of them confer an advantage for survival, so the presence, so one of them is not necessarily a, an advantage over the other one, then both of them are said to be an example of balanced polymorphism. You've probably heard of this example before, but you understand that sickle cell anemia is not a very good thing in the normal sense because it actually reduces the ability of your red blood cells to carry oxygen. And because it ends up making your red blood cells kind of sickle shaped, they're easier to catch on to each other and then cause small or larger blood clots in your various uh, arteries and veins and smaller capillaries as well too. However, being a carrier for this trait actually gives you a bit of an advantage, especially if uh, your community is stricken with malaria. So people who actually carry the diseased allele have a more natural increased immunity to malaria. So it actually increases survival rates as a result. So that's why that's an example of a balanced polymorphism. In other parts of the world where malaria is not such a big deal, that diseased allele actually causes more harm than good. And so in, in other parts of the world, it can be said to be a transient polymorphism. Shows up every now and then, but is not something that really sticks around because it does not confer an advantage to survival. So that's a very well-studied example of two different forms of a gene and leading to something, some kind of natural selection and evolution, and a fancy term for it is transient and balanced polymorphisms.